Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to be with you again. I can see a few faces, some of which I recognize. I can see a few faces I don't recognize, but names I know. What an honor to be with you this afternoon and a privilege. I'm going to try and start sharing my screen now and see what happens. Here we hope we go. Can you see my screen, everybody? Yeah, good, excellent. Good afternoon then, Anne's Interfering In-Laws, the Sutherlands. A very complex topic, and when I set up to give this talk, I realized how much I was depending on standing on the shoulders of giants. The work of others I've had to draw on extensively. I've done some research myself and I've put it together myself. So I hope it'll be of some interest. Off we go then. And here we move, if we're lucky, there. So if we look at this, the 1828 wedding, where did the Sutherlands come from? Were they actually interfering in what was their influence on Walker in the 1830s? What was their, Walker in, their influence on Anne Walker in the 1840s? And where did the Sutherlands go later? Starting then with the 1828 wedding, I'm sure many of you will know, about the wedding in October of 1828 between Captain Sutherland and Elizabeth Walker at Halifax Parish Church. Author James Parker in his book Hipper Home to Tong records that Captain Sutherland first met Elizabeth Walker at a ball in Halifax. This is the only account we have. If so, the balls were generally held at the new assembly rooms in Harrison Road. That was this building and the Scotsman was then stationed in Halifax. He was in the army and we think he was on recruiting duty. The boy and the girl fell in love. The trustees of the Walker Estates had been appointed under Elizabeth's father, John Walker's will. He died in 1823. They were, of course, both Walker relatives, William Priestley of Lightliffe and Henry Leeds Edwards of Pinest. Initially, both Priestley and Edwards opposed Elizabeth's marriage because they saw this young man from Scotland as a fortune hunter, a penniless Scots soldier, and they even threatened legal action. However, I think we say love found its way and had its way, and it went ahead. October, there we are, there's the marriage entry in the Halifax Parish Register, Captain George Mackay Sutherland, 93rd Regiment of Foot, Elizabeth Walker of Lightcliffe. What we have is also the first witness, the bride's sister, namely Anne Walker. And we move on. So where did the Sutherlands come from? And it's all in the name, of course. You're all familiar with Scotland in connection with, the, with Anne Lister, I guess, by now in many ways. This is just a general clan map of the north of Scotland. And the, can you see Sutherland towards the top, towards the right, that area in the county of Sutherland? That was where they came from. That was their stamping ground. And they were staunch unionists. They were behind the union rather than Jacobites. They also had Mackay blood. You can see, <coughs> excuse me, the Mackay clan was further to the northwest, near the north coast of Scotland. So they were a famous clan with the Sutherlands. Their head was the Earl of Sutherland who lived at Dunrobin Castle, pictured here. It's one of the oldest inhabited castles in Scotland and Captain Sutherland's ancestors had responsible positions under the Earls and the Countesses because sometimes they were Countesses in their own right. And some of the Sutherlands lived in this castle part time. We come down now to Captain Sutherland's father. George Sackville Sutherland of Uppert and Revis. He lived from 1770 to 1812 and he married Jean Mackay. They had a large family, but he died comparatively young, leaving a widow and children, and they couldn't afford to live at their house, their main house at Uppert, and moved to live in Inverness. Eldest son, George Mackay Sutherland, had been born at Uppert, which is near Brora not far from the Sutherland coast on the 10th of November, 1798. He joined the British army at the age of 14 and he became a captain in the 13th foot initially. 
one of the heirs of his uncle, Robert Sutherland, owner of the Waterloo Estate in St Vincent in what was then the British West Indies, was a slave owner, and we should acknowledge that. And in due course, some of the inheritance came to the Sutherlands in this country. In 1828, it was calculated that Captain Sutherland received a marriage settlement of £32,000. This is based on a reference in his will, and it seems to agree with other evidence contemporary. There we have Elizabeth Walker and her home, Crownest in Lightcliff, which had been built, we believe, by her grandfather about 40, 50 years earlier. In the diary of Anne Walker's cousin, Caroline Walker, who lived at Walter Clough, that's this old house in South Arum, which was demolished some 40 or 50 years ago. I don't think it looked in that condition when she lived there, mind you, but we can read early opinions as to Captain Sutherland, and I will read you one from Caroline Walker's opinion, the 18th of November, 1828, taken from an antiquarian society transaction uh, from 1908. Caroline Walker says, the family of Captain Sutherland is numerous. He has five brothers and sisters. He went into the army when about 14. And on the 12th of December, her sisters, this is Caroline's sisters, Delia, Georgiana and I, called upon Mrs. Sutherland at Crow Nest. She was gone out. We all only saw Anne, who is as reserved as ever. Captain Sutherland was hunting. We never saw the Highland laddie. If we move on to Christmas Day 1828, Anne Lister attended chapel at Lightcliffe, and this is what she recorded in her diary, when she saw the groom for the first time. Captain Sutherland better in appearance and manners than I expected. Very well. Talked about the Highlands. He was brought up in Rossshire, a mile from Golsby. Following the wedding, there was a successful, I think we can say it's a successful honeymoon at Buxton. And then the couple set off for Scotland. And in due course, some of their children were born down here in the Lightcliffe area. Others, most of them, in fact, in the north of Scotland. This house, which is no longer there, it was um, burned down some years ago, Udale House on the Black Isle. A lot of the correspondence from Captain Sutherland down to this area was uh, addressed from there. It was purchased by Captain Sutherland with the money he received as it was so with his wife's inheritance. If you want to know what the system of coverture was, I suggest you Google it. I'm not going to explain. Too complicated, but in a, in a sense, easy to understand when you've read about it. As you will probably know, Elizabeth and Anne Walker's only brother, John, who was younger than them, but because he was a boy, inherited the property from their father. He died at Naples while on his honeymoon in January 1830. His early death dramatically changed the fortunes of the Sutherland and the Walker sisters. Elizabeth and Sutherland and Anne Walker, they had an inheritance from their father, but they now were in line to receive half of the lands as well. So they were joint co-heiresses under the law. Two women had to have property divided amongst them. Old fashioned law, half in half. How was this going to be worked out? And this is one of the things we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So having married well and got a wife with a good allowance, Captain Sutherland now became very many times richer. And this was by his wife's estate. Under her father, John Walker's will, the entailed property was intended for his daughters personally. But in 1831, with the help of Robert Parker, the solicitor in Halifax, Elizabeth agreed to have her own property transferred into the hands of her husband. This may seem as though undue pressure was placed on her. However, at that time, such a handover from a wife to a husband was not really 
unusual. The eldest, well, no, the eldest son was born here at Lightcliffe, Crow Nest, in 1831. This is the baptismal record of Sackville, the eldest son, who was to go on and eventually sadly die at the age of 12. And so, were the Sutherlands actually interfering? This is a question. I have that in my title, but were they? And what was their influence on Anne Walker in the 1830s? In a presentation of this length, I have to produce bits and pieces, not as much as I'd like to, but I've realised as I've gone through the preparation, there's far more that I would have liked to have shown, so please bear with me and make of it what you will. Claims have been made Anne Walker was cruelly or unfairly treated by her sister Elizabeth and her husband George Mackay Sutherland. The question is, does such a claim stand up? We know that there were certain things that were done, which were in Anne Walker's interests or not, we might say. Let us consider a few of them. With the death of young John Walker in 1830, it was obviously necessary to divide the Walker family estates into two. Naturally speaking, this would be sensible to do it quite quickly, you might say. The property had to be divided between his sisters as co-heiresses. And in effect, this eventuality had been provided for under the will of John Walker Sr., who died back in 1823, had his son died. There was also a need to take into account an allowance out of the estates for young John Walker's widow Fanny. It may be that this latter issue, which I'm not going to refer to again, was something that held the process up. It isn't quite clear, but it could have done. In correspondence and legal papers that survive, there seems to have been no immediate plan by the Sutherlands to deal with the division of the Walker property. As I just said, it seemed logical and legally wise to have this carried out as soon as possible, to delineate who would have which sections. And the fact that it wasn't did leave great uncertainty as to what was going to be the property of the two sisters. There's no doubt that it was intended that Elizabeth, perhaps as the elder, was assigned the large house on the estates, namely Crow Nest. But without Anne Walker having a clearly defined inheritance, she was at some disadvantage, and her half or moiety of the estate, being undefined, how was she to know what she had the rights over? It's clear that she was assigned Lydgate for a home and would have been expected to inherit Cliff Hill on her aged aunt Anne's death. There certainly were a number of complications about the Walker estate. If any of you have studied what is now online and the studies of Ian Philp in particular and Dorothy at Lightcliffe, the way in which the Walker estate spread over various sections of land made life extremely complicated for such a settlement. However, there seems no evidence at all that Anne Walker actively complained about the lack of equal division until well after she met Anne Lister. Maybe she was not particularly bothered, I don't know. I don't think we can say conclusively. There are certain indications that the Sutherlands were not bothered about the estate division. They were busy with their bigger estates up in Scotland, happy to receive part of the income, I guess, from Crow Nest and the areas around here. And they weren't seeing Anne regularly, were they? They were hundreds of miles away in the north of Scotland. And they were planning, weren't they, to marry one of their relatives to her which would require a legal division of the Walker estate. You think it'd be in their interest on that basis to divide and settle what the estate consisted of. 
You will recall, many of you, that during 1833, Anne Walker spent many months staying with the Sutherlands in northern Scotland while considering whether to live with Anne Lister. Lots of things were going on both down here and up there in the year 1833, as you will probably recall. During the time that Anne Walker was up in Scotland, the Sutherlands were encouraging her to marry a cousin of theirs from the Mackenzie clan. Referring to the subject, we can look at Anne Lister's diary for the 18th of February, 1833. And this was when Captain Sutherland and his mother were on a visit to Shibden, and the mother chatted about Anne Walker with Anne Lister. Mrs Sutherland suggested that Anne Walker had £2,000 a year, asking if any love affair was on her mind. No, Anne Lister replied. Not sure what, quite what Anne thought when she was replying that, because I think she thought Anne Walker was in love with her. But Anne went on to, to learn that a Scottish relative had proposed to Anne Walker to pay off his debts. And this is the man who seems to have been encouraged to engage with her later during 1833. Back in the February, Anne commented, surely Captain Sutherland would take care that proper marriage settlements were made. Mrs Sutherland looked as if not expecting this. Poor girl, they want her for some of the kin if they can get her. Of course we know Anne Walker was wanted by Anne Lister for herself. This Captain Mackenzie, you can trace a few details about him, he was an impoverished cousin of Captain Sutherland's mother, much older than Anne, and he had a dubious claim to a baronetcy. All he was after, we can reckon, was the money that Anne would bring him. Thankfully, Anne Walker resisted this temptation, and so. We have to jump past some well-known events, which I just have to take into account that you're aware of, that from the spring of 1834, the two Anne's began to live together like a married couple at Shibden Hall, following a commitment. They also began to travel around and had some splendid adventures. However, around this time, Anne Lister was emphasizing rather strongly in some of her letters that, that Anne Walker had certain mental vulnerabilities. And this was in correspondence with the Sutherlands. And this was probably not as good an idea as it might have been. Although we know that Anne Lister tried very hard to take care of Anne Walker's mental health. If we look at an entry in Anne Lister's diary on the 27th of September, 1834, she's recording that not unreasonably, the Sutherlands had raised doubts as to whether when the joint property was to be divided, Anne Walker would be fit to absolutely run her half of the estate. Anne Lister writes, Anne fancies the Sutherlands are against a division of the property and wish to find out whether she is quite able to act for herself. What a strange business. An interview with Jonathan Gray, solicitor at York, shows the two women felt the Sutherlands were being dilatory over dividing the estate. And I think that is fair at this time. I quote the diary of 26th of November, 1834 at York. Mr. Jonathan Gray came at 10 and consulted him about the partition of the joint property. If done amicably, it might cost about 50 pounds. If not, Anne must file a bill in Chancery to compel it, which would cost about £150. On my right asking him to write down the best form of expressing the matter, he wrote to make a partition of the joint property, either by dividing it into two shares as equal in value, or maybe without reference to contiguity, contiguity being, of course, adjoining properties. And then there was another possibility of dividing into two shares of equal value without reference to this contiguity and the possibility of drawing lots as to which should have which section or which share of the property. Anne Lister's earlier emphasis in highlighting Anne Walker's vulnerabilities to the Sutherlands may not have been a terribly good idea because it gave them this 
option of saying, well, if we did divide this property or if we did agree to, maybe Ann Walker would not be able to cope. At the end of that year, 1834, Anne Lister records in her diary, the 21st of December, Anne fancies the Sutherlands are against a division of the property and wish to find out whether she is quite able to act for herself. What a strange business. 31st of March, 1835. There's an Elizabeth Sutherland draft or copy letter to her sister Anne, which includes the phrase, I think the division of the estate's very fair as it appears on paper. And this was a result of work, very diligent work, carried out by the surveys of Samuel Washington, the steward of the Cronest estate. And yet in a letter from Captain Sutherland to Anne Walker on the 18th of April, a little later, he writes, I assure you we have long been anxious for a division of the property, situated as the estates at present are. We could make no def definite or at all events satisfactory settlement on our younger children, while half the property on which it was secured belonged to you. Since your return from Scotland, you have never expressed the remotest dissatisfaction or hinted at a wish to have the property divided until December, when you intimated it for the first time. So there can be no objection, writes Captain Sutherland, writing to Robert Parker, or a draft letter which presumably went 20th of July, 1835, no objection to furnishing Mr. Gray with the copy of the deed alluded to. In fact, I'm most anxious as I invariably have been to offer every facility and assistance and endeavoring to have the property of the late Mr. Walker amicably divided. And here I would have to say, looking back at the earlier history, he was protesting too much. It doesn't appear there had been any very serious effort to settle the division of the estate in the previous four or five years. And now he is saying he always had the intention. Hmm, not quite sure about that. But they did agree eventually, the Sutherlands, and by the 25th of September 1835, a division of the Walker estate was legally achieved. But I have to say, looking at the evidence, had Anne Lister not pressed Robert Parker and the captain, that this division might never have been fulfilled. There's no doubt at all that the Sutherlands remained unhappy about the setup at Shibden and its final implications. How much they were aware of about the intimacy between the two Anne's is not quite clear. But the financial ramifications were something that they were puzzled about, where Anne Walker's money was likely to go. About this time, it seems as though relationships between the sisters improved. Of course, they were a distance apart, weren't they? And we're going to move on to the second part of what I have to say now. And this follows the time when in June 1839, the two Anne's set out on the European journey of a lifetime. And we go on to were the Sutherlands actually interfering and what was their influence on Anne Walker, 1840 to 41. I think we all know by now that tragically Anne Lister died in September 1840, the 22nd of the month, at Kutais in Georgia, to the far end of the Black Sea, rather a long distance away. And we all know about this extraordinary um, repatriation of Anne's remains, which is unrivaled, I say again, in anything I've read about the return of human remains over such a distance in the 19th century. That needs to be shouted from the rooftops as an accolade for Anne Walker and those who supported her. Now I have to begin to draw on the research of others in a different way. What happened next? From the recently revealed and highly commended research of Diane Holford and colleagues, we now know that Captain Sutherland traveled alone across Northern Europe to meet and accompany Anne Walker back. This hardly seems the action of an uncaring relative. We now know that he was at Warsaw in Russian Poland with Anne Walker 
by the 2nd of January 1841. And it's possible, so Diane says, that he may have traveled even further into Russia. I'm sure there'll be ongoing explorations of further archives and it'll be interesting to learn in due course. I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail about Anne Lister and her repatriation in this case. We know that the remains came back to Halifax. We know that there was a uh, return by the remains to Shibden Hall, following which a few days later, a funeral was held in Halifax Parish Church, today's Halifax Minster. There's mystery and a bit of a disputation about exactly where Anne lies buried and why her tombstone was damaged, but we're not going into that today. We're talking about Anne Walker and the influence of the Sutherlands. We know that by February 1841, Anne Walker had settled down to live at Shibden Hall. We might use the term Lady of the Manor. She was in charge. She was in charge of the estates and she had a life interest in the estate under the will of Anne Lister. So she could run the estate in her own name as if it was her own property, as it, indeed it was until she died. And then the intention was, of course, that it should revert to another branch of the listing. For some while, matters ran reasonably well. Early in 1843, a number of events seem to have happened. We can't, I don't think, dwell on cause. But in April 1843, there was an event which took place which Steve Crabtree, to whom I'm grateful for sharing his research too, described as the Durnford incident, reported in the Halifax Guardian of April the 8th, 1843. At this time, Anne, Anne Walker, illegally, ordered the Ordnance Survey men off the Shibden Hall estate. She had a right to order some people off the Shibden estate, but this was the wrong people and the wrong uh, community to tangle with. And so, in court, Anne Walker was fined two pounds, eight shillings and sixpence. And we may gather that this greatly damaged and standing in Halifax. That is a conclusion I have been told, but I can't quote from. By the summer of 1843, Anne Walker was suffering huge pressures for various other reasons. There are indications in documents which are too complex and too many to itemize that her administration of the Shibden estate was causing alarm to those who had some responsibility. Amongst these was Anne Lister's solicitor, and of course later, her estate manager from 1839, Robert Parker. For some years, it, it's clear Anne Walker had not quite trusted him. There were various issues they'd been through, and I'm not sure you can say he was a totally trustworthy man. Now she refused to cooperate with him at all. Whatever the reasons, he was unhappy about this and he became concerned. So no cooperation there, no communication. And it seems as though the communication between Anne Walker and her relatives in Scotland dwindled. It may be, not 100% certain, that it failed altogether. But this lack of contact really alarmed them up in Scotland. There's no doubt about that from letters that came south, both to solicitor and so on. Following Anne's failure to honor a commitment to buy Smith House at Lightcliffe, there was a threat to sue her. Again, you have to refer to the documents to learn more about this as we haven't time to express in this time. An unpaid debt to a carpenter resulted in a court case and a fine. Again, this would have caused embarrassment. But in many ways, the worst was an unsettled debt of £773 
to her local tenant, Jane Atkinson, which Anne disputed and now caused a further headache. You must remember that Anne didn't have exactly the normal resort to a solicitor as she had previously. Jane Atkinson employed a solicitor and won her case, but still Anne refused to settle the outstanding bill, which was demanded by the court. <laughs> Jane Atkinson's solicitor now applied for what was commonly called in Latin a fee far, a writ of execution, which would allow the sheriff and his officers to seize property for auction due to the non-payment of debt. This gave the sheriff and his officers the option of moving in on the premises, taking possession of goods and getting them ready for sale. And on the 17th of August, 1843, Sheriff's Officer Matthew Hiley and his bailiffs arrived at Shibden Hall. They forced entry to the house and in due course set up camp, I think that's a fair enough term, in Anne's kitchen, the Shibden Hall kitchen. And I apologise to Catherine at Shibden Hall for showing her in the kitchen. I'm sure she had nothing to do with these events back in 1843. So this sheriff's officer, Matthew Hiley, had moved in and he had the power to distrain, he had the power to sell contents of Shibden Hall. He also ensured that Ann Walker didn't have access to heat. He was stopping the wood getting through and the coal, we believe, in order that Ann could heat the hall. All right, it was August, she might not have needed it, but she probably needed light. I don't know how things were going, but they were very dire for Anne and her household with this chap and his, his, his rowdy men, shall we call them, in the kitchen, Shibton. Now other people began to take a very serious interest. Jonathan Gray, the York solicitor, I won't explain the relationship, I'm sure most of you know by now, uh, connected with the Walkers. The two solicitors agreed that Robert Parker would remove and hide various goods, the more valuable goods at the hall or arrange for this to be done. These were the goods which were likely to be seized by the sheriff's officer, who was apparently at this time only stationed in the kitchen. And this would appear to have gone ahead. So what did the Sutherlands know about what was going on? We must remember at this time, they were living up in the north of Scotland, a long, long way distant. Uh, certain indications that I've said of a lack of communication directly with Anne, and most communication would be with Robert Parker and perhaps with Jonathan Gray. So hearing from a distance of Anne's actions, or we might say her inactions and con the concerns, Elizabeth Sutherland arranged to travel south and gave Robert Parker some specific instructions. She asked him to settle the debt with Hiley, the sheriff's officer, promising to make the money up to him when she arrived in Halifax. So this uh, enabled the, uh, the lifting of this threat from the sheriff. The very day before the due auction of Shibden Hall contents, or potentially some of them, Robert Parker settled the Jane Atkinson suit, that's the court case, which was outstanding, and that included costs. The Sutherlands were still up in Scotland, this had been done remotely and it would take a while to get down to the south, and they hurried south in due course, separately they travelled, leaving their children behind, they were very concerned about the situation. They didn't go and try and stay at Shibden. The reasons for this we have to, perhaps we're not quite sure of. They went to stay with the Edwards cousins at Pinest. It may have had something to do with being unsure how Anne Walker would receive them. Seems that they hadn't been on very good terms at all and Anne may have broken off the correspondence. Elizabeth Sutherland tells us that the effect of Anne's catastrophic actions that summer had made her a laughingstock in Halifax. 
For the safety of Anne Walker herself and for the future integrity of the Shibden estate, it seemed as though something had to be done, but what? We learn this from the letters of Dr. Belcombe and Captain Sunderland in August to October 1843. So here we have Shibden Hall around a little bit later in the century. I'm just going to tell you that Samson has arrived to say hello to you all. If you can see him, he's come to say how do. I'll try not to let him distract me at all and you'll jump, jump off the other side. So Robert Parker's um, offices were in the square in Halifax, which as many of you will now know, I'm sure, is the same square, sadly demolished in 1959, where the beloved Helena Whitbread was born in 1931. What an interesting coincidence. So Robert Parker now worked a plan along with Captain Sutherland and his wife and taking into account the influence of, of Dr. Belcom at York who of course was the brother of Marianna Lawton and Lister's former lover. Who, and of course, Dr. Belcom had treated Anne Walker successfully over several years. He appears to have been a man that Anne Walker would trust. And it was under his care that Anne Walker was removed from Shibden Hall, we have to say apparently with her own consent, on the 9th of September, 1843. There's nothing to indicate that the Sutherlands were forcing this removal. And Captain Sutherland certainly did not kidnap her as some seem to have claimed. Anne was apparently persuaded to leave quietly under Dr. Belcombe's guidance, although we have to see that neither he nor her relatives nor Parker were present. And without that first-hand testimony, perhaps the full details are not clear. We know the stories that have been attached to Anne Walker's red room at Shibden Hall, that lovely bedroom with the four-poster bed and so on. This was found locked and in a filthy condition the day after Anne Walker had been removed, not at the time that she was removed, and it was not accessed by out externally, as far as we can see, before Anne left the hall, and it seems the door was only broken down the next day so the Sutherlands could obtain clothing and other articles for Anne. However, um, we have to accept that some of these facts, was there an attempt to get in earlier? We don't know. Anne Walker, as we do know, I think by now, was removed to a house at Osbald Vic near York, Elizabeth Tozy's house, which was a, a location where she was not in, incarcerated as in a lunatic asylum as some have claimed in the past only really through lack of research i mean this modern research which we have has thrown fresh lights on it for which we say hooray and thank you although equally we say how sad it is that Anne walker was in such conditions but she was not held under restraint there are indications that that people at this location and there were only a small number of them were able to have exercise outside and even go to church. It wasn't pleasant, but maybe nothing like as bad as an asylum. By October 1843, it appeared under the guidance of those responsible that Anne Walker's certification as a lunatic, or we might say a person of unsound mind, was inevitable. A complex process was required to establish the estate of her mind. And this is a petition for commission, which was put in by her nearest re relatives, Captain and Elizabeth Sutherland, in towards the end of 1843, a printed version of it. And so a commission and inquisition of lunacy was held at the Royal Hotel in Brighouse in November 1843. And for this, 24 jurors were selected. They had to assess Anne's soundness of mind. 17 of them agreed with the verdict, while seven dissented. Evidence was produced and Anne Walker was in the vicinity. So they had to make up their mind on what they heard and saw. It was attested in the resulting Inquisition document of the 28th of November, 1843, 
that Anne is not sufficient for the government of herself, her manners, mess wages, lands, tenements, goods and chattels, and that she, the said Anne Walker, hath been in the same state of unsoundness of mind from the 15th day of October in the year of our Lord, 1841. But how or by what means the said Anne Walker so became of Anne's son mind, the jurors aforesaid, said, know not unless by the visitation of God. Nobody yet has successfully explained to me why this date in October 1841 was the lynch point. It is a mystery, as far as I know, but you may have ideas. Now officially a person of unsound mind, and we might legally use the term lunatic, a commission was established to manage Anne Walker's affairs. Her sister Elizabeth was appointed Anne's committee of person, while Captain Sutherland, her husband, became Anne's committee of estate. We have some news of Anne Walker while she was away from Chibden and still at, apparently at Oswaldwick. In a letter from Captain Sutherland, who was then down at St John's Wood, London, writing to Robert Parker in February 1844. I lament to say my wife is very ill indeed, that's Elizabeth, Miss Walker in perfect health and very quiet, the time constantly occupied in writing to the Herald's office, to whom she represents all her complaints. Of course, her letters never leave the house, and it is fortunate that she amuses herself in some way. You'll have your own opinion as to whether that's fair or not. In April, Elizabeth Sutherland, a very sick woman by this time, writes to Robert Parker, again from London. Dr. Belcombe writes that my poor sister's bodily health is much improved, but her delusions remain as strong as ever. She, however, goes to church. We take possession of our house tomorrow, and in the course of the week, we hope she will also be here, when we will, of course, get for her the best advice. So Anne Stair Oswaldwick was not too prolonged, and there's evidence she joined the Sutherland household in the London area by May 1844, it may have been slightly before, but her consumptive sister's health was declining fast. And Elizabeth Sutherland died at Abbey Lodge, Merton, South London on the 27th of December 1844, being buried at Wimbledon shortly afterwards. Captain Sutherland did not try and bring his wife's body back to life, did he? What does that say about him? That's an extra question I throw in. Captain Sutherland and family, plus Anne Walker, we gather, returned sadly to Shibden Hall, and we have this reference. Retain the allowance for maintenance from the 28th of December 1844 to the 17th of April 1845, when the lunatic was removed to Shibden Hall at 1,500 pounds per annum. So the movements around of Anne Walker are not fully clear as yet. There are indications, slight irritations, shall we say, in his letters, that although Captain Sutherland did move into Shibden Hall, as was indeed his right as a guardian of Anne's estate, as committee, he was not very happy about the arrangement. And I believed he longed to be back in Northern Scotland and he was trying to expand his estates there around this time. Clearly he was very frustrated. But as you probably know by now, he married again to a Halifax girl and she was Mary Elizabeth Hay. My own observation here seems to indicate we have Anwar continuing to live quietly in Sutherland's household at Shibden, but almost invisible. I think you know by now that sadly Captain Sutherland died at the age of only 48 years at Shibden Hall in April 1847. This is of course his tomb at Lightkin. And we might say here yeah, the Sutherland influence over Anne really ended. Because, of course, new committees of person and estate had to be established who were not Sutherland. So we're not going to go on talking about Anne Walker in her connection with the Sutherland. As you probably know, early in 1848, following her aged aunt's death, Anne Walker was moved to her own property at Cliff Hill, 
where she was cared for, I trust, satisfactorily and hopefully humanely and kindly until her death, which took place in February 1854, and she was buried on March 3rd at Knightcliffe Chapel. So, were they interfering with Sutherland? You tell me. If there's time for questions, that's over to you. I'm going to express a few opinions as to their relationship with Anne Walker. To me, it seems as though the Sutherlands were very slow dividing the Walker estates in the early 1830s. They could have gone about it much more carefully and quickly if they'd wanted to. All the indications I've seen tend to the conclusion that Captain Sutherland's relationship with his wife, Elizabeth Walker, was a normal, happy family one with no clear indication of tension. And I've discovered no conclusive evidence that Captain Sutherland and his wife treated Anne Walker unkindly or cruelly. There are certain things that Sutherland wrote in some of his letters that indicate his frustration with her situation. We do, I think, need to accept that Anne Walker was in an extremely vulnerable state by September 1843 and that something had to be done. Whether what was done was right or wrong, you will have your own opinion. So I consider the Sutherlands both felt frustrated about and lacked the ability to understand the relationship of Anne Walker with Anne Lister, which was really an unknown. It was an unknown both legally and to many people in those days. So it was rather a mystery. And what they understood about the intimacy, I have no idea. So very briefly, when I set out to put this presentation together, I had intended to talk at more length about where the Sutherlands went later. My time is very nearly up, so I therefore have to cut it rather short. You all probably know that the only surviving son of Captain and Elizabeth Sutherland was Evan, Evan Charles Sutherland Walker of Crowness, born in the north of Scotland in November 1835. His elder brothers died young, and on reaching the age of 21, his estates having been in the hands of guardians until he reached that after his father's death, in 1856 he succeeded to both his mother's and his aunt's estates, and that reunited the Walker lands as they had been before 1830 and before the formal division of 1835. Captain Sutherland Walker, he had to adopt the surname of Walker additionally to inherit his aunt's lands, although he later dropped it. And he was a strange man. But he did do one or two good things, some of which we can still see today. Sadly, this is not one of them. This is a lovely reconstructive sketch by Hilary Griffiths of the stained glass in the east window at Lightcliffe Chapel, which was paid for by Evan in memory of his parents, his brother, and Aunt Anne, and we know it was made in Scotland. But sadly, when the church that there at Lightcliffe fell into decay and was damaged in the late 1960s, this window was destroyed. We only have pictures of it, and it's nice to see this colourful representation. I believe I've been told that it was the left-hand section representing Christ with the children that was in memory of Anne Walker, and remember, Anne Walker had a great interest in the welfare of children. She was very keen to find, to found that likely school, that church school, Sunday school. So she and the children, I think of when I look at that. But we're still surviving. We do have the plaque of 1864 and the window, both at Halifax Minster. It was presented by Evan to the then Halifax Parish Church in that year commemorating his maternal walk family and those of them who are buried within its walls. And it has that wonderful representation of the Walker arms devised by Anne Walker herself and about which Lynn Scholes has um, written so interestingly elsewhere. The window and the building plaque are now in separate parts. As some of you will know, it's confusing. It's all to do with renovations from 1958. 
So we've just about got to the end at last. Evan Charles Sutherland Walker, the inheritor. He eventually tried to sell up at Lightcliffe, bought an estate in Scotland, which was not unreasonable. He had problems selling his estate in Lightcliffe and had to hang on to some of it. He bought Skibo Castle and he vastly overspent and he treated his tenants appallingly. His, cre his creditors eventually took Skibo and the remaining Lightcliffe lands into their own hands. He didn't have a penny of them in 1890. So I consider he was really a rogue in the way he treated his tenants, not a very nice man at all. I think in comparison, his father, Captain Sutherland, was much more decent. But you will have your own idea. Evan died in London in 1913 at the age of 77, leaving just over a thousand pounds. And I'm very sorry that time now does not allow me to say more on the subject of him and his descendants today. That will perhaps wait for another time. We just have to see. Thank you all very much for watching and I hope I haven't gone on too long. Thank you very much, everybody. And these are my thanks. And I have wholehearted thanks to everybody here, some of whom I have met, some of whom I have never met nor seen. Maybe some of them are online today. Lovely to see you if you are. Some who probably don't know me at all. And maybe some credits I've failed to give. Please forgive and thank you very much. All right, so we're now in the Q&A part and we have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> okay, I mean, probably three questions. We are at uh, five minutes to the end, so let's try to, to be uh, quick. So first one, uh, both Ann Walker and Ann Lister seemed dissatisfied with their lawyers at various times, but kept, uh, kept them and uh, kept using their services extensively. Uh, were there no other good lawyers in, Al in the Halifax region at the time? Robert Parker was regarded as the best solicitor in Halifax at the time, there's no doubt at all. But like many solicitors of his time and possibly even more recently, uh, there were occasions when he took a few liberties. And we can learn that from Anne Lister's diaries. I think he did as well as anybody might have done for Anne Lister. All right, so uh, this one is a little bit more on the <clears throat> topic of wills. So let's see if we can uh, figure it out. So why would the court take Anne's property from the Walker estate rather than from Shipden? Uh, and how did that action affect Marion's life estate interest in Shipden? First of all, it wasn't the Walker estate strictly at Shipden, it was the Lister estate. So the oversight had to be um, there had to be some oversight by Anne Lister's solicitor on behalf of Anne Walker. So it was actually Lister property as much as Walker property, which was going to be liable to be removed from Shibden Hall. I hope that helps a little bit. Could you just repeat the second part of the question? The today? second part is, and how did that action affect Marion's, Marion Lister's life estate interest in Shibden? I think, so, the, I think the answer to that has, has to be, we have no idea, but it could have affected things very badly had the parts of the estate been uh, seized and sold off, um, starting with property in the hall, it would have affected some in some way Marion's eventual inheritance, yes. Okay, not arguing with you in there. Anyway, <laughs> but final one. Uh, did Evan Charles Sutherland Walker and Anne Walker ever meet later on? That I'm not absolutely sure of. I've not seen evidence of it. We certainly have evidence that, he, that Anne Lister was aware of Evan as a, as a child. We have to remember that there is um, not much evidence of Anne Walker going up to Scotland in the late 1830s, and I'm not sure about the Sutherlands traveling south. Maybe somebody who is online now can tell me if that took place. But if she didn't, I think it's unlikely that Anne ever met Evan until the days when they were both living together at Shibden Hall uh, after Anne had been moved in there in the mid 1840s. Then 
he would presumably have known her as part of the household when he was a boy of about 10. Uh, all right, so this is probably the last one. Uh, what happened to Sackville, um, son of the Sutherlands? He died at the age of 12, I think rather suddenly. You can, you can reference that in some of the list of papers. I'm afraid I can't give you the reference. So there were three sons and three daughters. There was the little girl who died and was buried at Lightcliffe. I think she was called Mary, wasn't she, at the age of 15. Sackville died at the age of 12. John, the second son, died at the age of two. Both the boys were buried up in the north of Scotland, I think at Kirk Michael in the churchyard there. I hope that helps. Uh, all right, so if anyone has any final questions, drop them in the chat, as long as they are very, very quick, because we are almost at time. All right, I'm not entirely sure if there's anything else, so <clears throat> I'm assuming not. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, joining us for this session, David. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you, and uh, this was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we will now follow to a break, and then there's another session after. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.